10 things you didn't know Rails could do. Hopefully, Dr. Nick is already questioning uh, my authority on that subject, but I'll do my best. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm James Edward Gray II. I've uh, been in the Ruby community a long time. I think these days most people know me as the uh, regular panelist on the Ruby Rogues podcast. Um, I've actually seen people tweet things like, uh, Mr. Ruby Rogues or the Chief Ruby Rogue. And uh, that's a little weird because it's Chuck's show. So I, I guess that means I'm the most opinionated one or something like that. I don't know. Either way, it probably doesn't reflect well on me. Uh, so this talk probably needs some explanation because you're probably going to find it bizarre and quirky. Uh, a lot of times, like when people watch over my shoulder while I'm programming or something, they say, Oh, I didn't know you could do that, or how'd you do that, or something. And uh, so I thought, well, it'd be cool to take some of those things and just put them together in a talk and show uh, a bunch of people stuff like that. And I figured, you know, 10, get a good, well-rounded set of them. But then I saw that they stuck me in the big room, you know? I was like, oh, 10, it's kind of weak. Uh, I mean, if I had known they were going to stick me in the big room, I'd have written a good talk, you know? Uh, <laughs> So anyways, we're going to up it. How about 42? Let's do uh, 42 things you didn't know where else to do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Stop clapping. We're in a hurry. <laughs> all right. I tested all of these things on the current stable release of Rails. So they do work on that. If you try them on anything else, you're on your own. <laughs> OK, so let's go for it. First of all, the number one reason everybody should use Rails is you can get a hug every single Friday, right? Have you seen this? Aaron Patterson does these tweets of these uh, virtual hugs, and people tweet him hugs back, and then there's this site that uh, collects all of them. Some of these are awesome. Here's fellow Ruby Rogue, Avdi, looking pretty nice there. Local Adam Keys, I'm giving a hug, right? It was nice of these ladies to participate. You can get a hug from an alien. How cool is that? Or Bubba Fett, uh -huh. pretty cool. But this one can't be beat. This is the underwater Friday hug, right? Yeah, I dare you to top that. OK, I'm going to poke around rails at different places. Uh, we'll start with just like the interface and see what we can see from there. So here we go. Uh, one of the things you can do in Rails now is you can actually have a Rails application in one file, a pretty small file, right? All you got to do is require the right things, build a Rails application, set some routes and a secret, and write controllers as normal, and you're off and running. This is a complete Rails application. So you don't actually have to have that massive file structure anymore. It's kind of a testament to how much they've component, componentized it, if that's a word. Um, Another thing Rails knows about is these special comments, like this to-do comment, fix me comment, optimize comment, right? And then there's a rake action that takes these comments and tells you about them, right? Or you can ask for just to-dos or just fix me's. You can even do your custom ones. So like if you want to leave a note to someone, and then you can have Rails search for that particular note. Uh, so you can do custom stuff like this. And as a bonus, if you're a TextMate user, uh, there's a bundle included with TextMate that knows about these comments as well, at least the to-dos and fix me's. So you can just bring up that bundle and get to them that way. Uh, and they're hyperlinked. You can teach it the other comments if you want to. Uh, Rails has the ability to sandbox the console. So if you want to play around and have your database changes reverted afterwards, you can do that. So you can see here, I don't have anything in the database. Then I fire up a console in sandbox mode, add some entries, so now we have quite a bit in the database. But as soon as I exit, it's all undone. Behind the scenes, it wraps it in a transaction, and it does a rollback when you exit. So you can play around with database stuff without committing. Um, I, I didn't know about this one until recently, but you can call helper methods in the Rails console. They give you this helper object, and you can just uh, put any method you want on the end of that. Uh, so I, I didn't know you could uh, do that until pretty recently. It's a neat way to play around with that code. Uh, I like using non-Webrick servers in development. 
That's pretty easy to do. You just, uh, in your gem file, you can specify the server you want and then just uh, pass it as an argument to the rail server. So in this case, I'm using bin. I find it's usually a little faster, a little more full featured. So uh, if you want to play around with different servers, you can do that. Uh, here's a neat one that uh, Josh Susser pointed me at. Uh, a lot of times when you make in a plugin or something, we do configuration like in a file and config initializers, uh, you know, and set some things up there. Uh, a better way is uh, in your rail tie, just assign uh, this object, active support ordered options, to some uh, setting on the config object, then, uh, yeah, like that. And then uh, in the Rails application, as long as that's been loaded before you're configuring your application, which in a plugin it would be here, I'm just requiring it manually, but then you can do config, you know, dot whatever your library is, dot setting, and just assign it. So basically, you can configure your plugins the same way Rails configures itself, right? If you want to see a good real-world example of this, the SAS works this way. Uh, so you can check it out. <laughs> this one's great, right? This is my new favorite website. You guys like this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. This is my favorite part right here. I'm sure that PHP guys don't have any drama, <laughs> right? Yeah. No way they do. Let's look at the database. Um, you guys know you can do migrations on the database, I'm sure, passing arguments, uh, strings, and stuff like that. Rails understands a shorthand form of this now, uh, where you can do it a little, little shorter, so like you can leave off the type setting and that gets you a string automatically. You can also give limits if you want in the curly braces, so you can like limit the field to a certain size. Uh, more on uh, migrations, you can set indexes now on the command line, uh, which is kind of cool. You can do normal indexes or even specify unique, right, if you want a unique index. You put those after the type. So in this case, the fields don't have a type. They get the string default, but then the indexes go after that. Uh, another thing you can do is, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to admit until like really recently, I always did the user ID column myself. Uh, in the migration, but actually uh, migrations know how to do uh, associations. So you can say that you have this article and it references a user. This does like three things. First, it sets up this call, which is what actually makes the user ID. Uh, it also now adds an index, which is great for performance. And if you generate the model as well, like I did here, then it'll put in the association in the model for you. Right, so kind of a nice shortcut. If you don't like the word references, it also understands belongs to. It's the exact same thing. So you can use either one. Um, <laughs> this is another way I'm embarrassed to admit. When people ask me, has that migration been applied? I log into the database and try to find the fields or whatever, you know? So you know Rails can tell you if a migration's been applied? You can just run this break task and it'll tell you. These have, these haven't. It's kind of handy. Um, this one isn't for you, it's for me. This is the most common thing I get emailed. So I figured, you know, put it in here, throw it up on the uh, internet, and I can stop answering those emails. Um, so if you have some data and you'd like to load it into your Rails database, uh, it's pretty easy with the uh, standard CSV library. Just require CSV and loop over the data. The two things you probably want to do is turn on header parsing and switch the headers into symbols. That'll make them look like what Rails is expecting for your active record fields. And then just convert each row to a hash as you pass it along, right? So you can load your database that way with CSV. Uh, Rails can also write CSV in your database now if you want to. Uh, Aaron Patterson added uh, this option to serialize where if the object you pass in the second understands a load and a dump, Rails will use that to serialize the content and bring it back. Um, so here I'm just delegating to the CSV library to turn it into CSV and turn it back. And then you can see uh, that I can serialize objects because I put an array in, I get an array back. Uh, but if you look at the database content, it's actually CSV, right? Which I think reads a little bit better in the database and it's usually a little easier to query than that YAML. But, you know, pretty only good if you're just doing arrays. If you're doing more complicated stuff, the YAML's probably better. Uh, Here's a good one I didn't know about until I saw a blog comment from Ryan Bates recently. Uh, a lot of times I just want a uh, 
specific field of the database, and so I pick that field, and then I uh, map over it to change them all into that field. Rails now has a method for this called pluck. So you can just pluck them right out of the database as a set of fields. And uh, you can also put a unique in front of it, too, if you want to get distinct items out of the database. So if you want to see all the different uh, statuses or whatever, you can, you can pluck them out of the database. Uh, I always seem to stumble on this one on accident uh, when I'm uh, using code in the console or something. But then I actually used it on purpose the other day and thought it was pretty cool. Um, so say you have like these events and they have different triggers. Uh, and I'll just make a bunch of events here. And you know you can count them, dot count, you get 13. But if you put a group in front of that count, it will count the individual groups. So X number of this type, X number of this type. Right? It's kind of handy. Um, this was a patch Josh Susser did to Rails uh, not too long ago that allows you to uh, override the association methods Active Record creates for you. Um, so this is the example off his blog, but if you have a car and you were tracking the owner of the car, then when a new owner gets set, maybe you want to keep track of the old one, you can write the new method and then just delegate it up to the one Rails gave you. You didn't used to be able to do that without some clever aliasing. So that's handy. Uh, this trick is somewhere between cool and evil, I think. Um, <laughs> which is my favorite kind of trick. Um, I, sometimes I want to instantiate an active record object, and I want to tell it what it is, like what its ID is and stuff like that. Um, you can do that with the instantiate method. If you try to use you know, the normal constructors, it won't let you like, set the ID and stuff. Uh, but you can do this. Sometimes it comes in handy in testing and things like that. Uh, you can kind of mock out an active record object without even using the database, which is kind of neat. Um, and it's a real object. You can see that if you do save it, it really is going to change it under the hood because that ID ties it to the existing record. Um, this is another tip from uh, Josh's blog. Uh, Postgres doesn't have to have a limit on its strings. Uh, like MySQL does. So if you want, uh, but unfortunately, Rails enforces the limit. <laughs> so, but you can use this little bit of code down here to shut it off, and then uh, and then you can have limitless strings in MySQL. Or sorry, not MySQL, Postgres. Uh, so you you know have a field that's just a normal string because I'm inheriting the default type there. But notice I can store 10,000 characters in there, no problem. Um, and of course, you could always use a text field for something like that, but uh, a good reason given on uh, Josh's blog is that you know maybe you're using something like simple form, which uh, is going to decide on text field, text area in your HTML based on the field type or something. So uh, you can still get that benefit, but be able to stick a lot of data in there. Kind of cool. OK, this is one of my favorites. Um, and the reason everybody should be using Postgres now, right? Um, you can do full text search in Postgres. So say we have an article um, you know, with a subject and a body, and we're going to index these and search them. In the migration, you can just add a column to hold the uh, concatenated search content. TS vector is the type in Postgres. And then uh, you need to use a little SQL here. But this is one of the biggest points of confusion, I think, between Postgres and MySQL. Uh, MySQL. Uh, MySQL has a bolted on kind of crappy full text search engine, right? And Postgres, you notice the index I select here is G-I-N. It stands for Generic Inverted Index. That's what Sphinx uses to do its searching, right? So this is a real full text search engine. It's not bolted on. It's not crappy. Um, so you set the uh, database to index it. And then you can set up a trigger to keep it updated whenever the data changes. On the other side, you got to use a little uh, Postgres syntax to do the actual searching. Um, but one trick here, you can do 2TS query. There's a, a function called 2TS query. It'll let you use operators and stuff, but it's really picky, so you're going to have to pre-process the user's input to get it right. But if you use this plain 2TS query, it's kind of a just do what I mean version of the search, and it'll usually just do the right thing. Uh, so it's a really simple way to set up plain text search. And you can see, I'll create a bunch of records here, and you can search, and I'm matching fields with that. Uh, content in either space. Notice it doesn't care about capitalization. 
And I told it my language was English, so it's doing some stemming for me there. I search for stemming and I get this stemmed, right? So this is a real full text search, good stuff. Great reason to use Postgres too. This one doesn't apply to uh, every scenario, uh, but if you can use it, it's uh, kind of cool. If you have one of those applications where all your users are just manipulating their own data, right, and it's not really like site-wide data, then you can put each user in their own database. And it actually doesn't take very much code to do this. It works great with something like SQLite where each database is in a separate file. And you just load some configuration, swap out the database name, and then reset active records connection, right, so that it's pointed at that new database. I stuck this in a library and then made sure it was required by my application. And then I built some migrations for it. So uh, migration to add a new database and a migration to migrate all existing databases, apply the migrations over all of them. You don't really need to know all this code. I basically stole it right out of Rails' own migrations, except for this one part where I'm just calling that method, right, to switch databases when I need to. Uh, and then you can see me using them here. So I add a couple of databases and I migrate them all up. And if you look at my migrations, they're happening multiple times, right? Because they're happening once for each database. So uh, it copies them across. And then same thing in the console here. I can use that method to switch databases at will. And notice if I pump a bunch of records in here, the IDs reset because it's a totally different database, right? So uh, it's all separate. And then uh, to set it up in the application controller, uh, again, I just use that method based on whatever means I need to switch databases. In this case, I'm using the subdomain. So the end result is that you can look at this uh, same page, you know, but depending on the subdomain I pass, I see totally different results because I'm pointed at a different database. This can be extremely efficient, by the way, right? Because your database doesn't grow, grow, grow. You only have your one user's records in that database. And uh, you're not all fighting over the same pipe, right? When you have one database, everything's got to go through that one pipe. But for every set of data is in a separate file, then you know, you're just fighting for access to that one file. So not a big deal. OK, how are we doing so far? Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> I didn't think I could do 42 straight, so we had to take a break. Um, but you have already gotten like more than half or more than double what you paid for, right? So, 21. Um, I thought I'd talk about why I do this. Um, it, you know, it seems weird just throwing a bunch of random ideas at Rails. I read this cool study uh, recently about uh, comparing old schooling, like when I was in school. I'm getting old. You can see my gray hair. Um, when I was in school, they made you cram, you know, memorize a bunch of facts. And nowadays, they try not to do as much facts, and they do more uh, just freestyle thinking and stuff like that, thinking that you'll be able to get your way to the facts. Uh, but we've actually done some tests, and it turns out that all that fact stuff is uh, pretty handy, and sometimes the fact guys <laughs> can outthink the thinking guys, right? And the reason is that you have, like, um, a stronger foundation to build ideas off of, right? If you have a bunch of things you know, you have higher confidence, more points to leap off from, stuff like that. So I thought this might uh, give you just some new things in Rails that hopefully you haven't seen before, give you new ways to play with it. Also, it was kind of fun. I had to reread about half the Rails source to figure some of this stuff out. If you go through and play with these, I promise you'll learn some things too. I, I definitely learned a lot. So uh, it's kind of fun just to play around with. OK, no more breaks. We got 21 more to go, right? Let's get back to it. We should probably talk about fashion sense. Rails definitely affects that, I think, a little bit. This is Aaron looking uh, kind of like he looked this morning, pretty dapper, right? We've also seen him more in a kind of Gilligan's Island kind of uh, style. I'm not real sure. And sometimes he seems to go off the rails altogether, right? Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Uh, Rails modifies Ruby in uh, quite a few ways. That's what Active Support does, of course. I can't show you all of Active Support. It's massive, but I'll pick out some tidbits. Um, here's a cool one. Uh, you can write some data to the file system atomically. Uh, so if you just want a file to pop out on the file system fully formed, uh, you can call this method, give it a path where you want it to appear, write some data to it, and uh, 
behind the scenes, of course, it uses, it creates a temp file, dumps it in there, and then it moves it into place at the end, uh, which is an atomic operation on most file systems. Uh, be careful if you're on an NFS drive, but other than that, it probably works. Um, it's kind of interesting if you need, you can, uh, it's hard for me to show you on a slide, but uh, it actually appears just all at once, right? There's no danger of getting like a half completed file. And you can see that the file pops out. Say if you were gonna have some process watching the directory for files to appear in it, that's why you might use something like that. Uh, you know probably about the merge method in Ruby where you can join two hashes, but if you're messing with nested hashes, the inner hashes might just get replaced because it really only works at the top level. Uh, which, uh, but Rails has this deep merge method, so it'll go all the way down and merge all the hashes down the tree, so you can merge one that's down there a ways. This uh, sometimes comes in handy with params, right, because it's a big nested hash. Um, here again, another trick I use for params sometimes. Uh, the, if I want to pass just all the parameters to say to a search function or something like that, but I don't want to pass on like the controller and the action, that doesn't have anything to do with it. You can use this accept method to knock things out of the hash, right? So that you can just pass on what you want. It's kind of handy. Uh, here's another one that's kind of hard to explain, but um, basically uh, merge and reverse merge, if the item's not in there, they both do the same thing. Uh, but in the other case where the item is in there, uh, merge is gonna replace it. Um, and so that makes it hard to do defaults for like a parameters hash. Because in Ruby, if you wanna do defaults, you create the hash, you put your defaults in it, then you merge in the real data. So the real data replaces the defaults, right? But we can't really do that with params because params already exist before we get to it, right? So we can't have the defaults in it. You can use reverse merge for that. It will merge it in if it's not already in there, right? If it is already in there, then it won't merge it in. So you can add defaults like after the fact, kind of uh, backwards from the other system. This one you all know about, and I bet you use it, but uh, I'll show you a way I like to use it. Let's say we add a status on our articles, a status field and I'll be sure in the migration to make sure it's got some value in it and it's never empty. Um, Rails has this ability, which you're probably familiar with from testing the environment, where you can have the string, but then you can ask it, are you development, question mark, are you test, question mark. The way it accomplishes that is with this magic inquiry method that you can call on a string and then you can use the question mark queries at the end of it. Uh, but I want to be able to use it on my article, right, to check those statuses, are you a draft, are you published, kind of thing. It's not very hard to add that because we usually, when we're using a field like this, we usually have a constant set to all the available uh, states of it, so we can do something like validates inclusion of or something. If you have that, you can just use this really simple method missing and delegate those states down to the underlying string using uh, inquiry, so then you can support that interface. Okay, so uh, Dr. Nick wanted some new reading material. You didn't actually end up on the cover of a magazine for working on Rails. Did you guys know that? It's pretty cool stuff. This is not the only magazine DHH has appeared in. Do you guys know the other one? Wired. Yeah, that's right, Wired. Where they called him the hottest hacker on earth. <laughs> what do you guys think of that? Do not laugh, guys. This is serious. Think about the competition. <laughs> right? <laughs> All right, so let's go to the views. Let's talk about looks. I'll tell you, a lot of these come out of the Rails View, which is a book I've been reading recently. It's really good. So uh, if you want to learn these and other stuff, I recommend it. Uh, Here's a good one. We can always use HTML comments, but actually ERB has a comment syntax too. If you use the ERB contact comment syntax, the advantage is they go away at compile time for the ERB template, so they don't make it down to the page that the user actually sees, right? So you can put comments in your stuff, but the user never sees them. It's pretty cool. Uh, this one, <laughs> I think it's because I'm the guy who wrote the ERB documentation originally, so I've been familiar with this mode forever. Nobody else uses it. Uh, I swear I'm the only person on the planet that uses this feature, but I'm gonna tell you you're all wrong. So 
uh, this feature rocks. Rails used to support it uh, with uh, this setting, config action view trim mode. They broke this in Rails 3 when they moved to eRubis, which is a kind of ERB lookalike. So I came up with this hack that uh, restores it basically by replacing the ERB implementation in Rails with one that has the feature I want. So uh, you can use this code to do it. I also submitted a pull request just like a week ago to put the feature back in Rails. So if you like this feature, try it out and go uh, say so on my pull request. Maybe they'll put it back in. Uh, but the idea is you can use ERB like this. Instead of having to do the double angle brackets and the percents, you can just put one percent sign at the beginning of the line. And uh, the whole line is Ruby at that point, And it will be removed from the final output. So uh, you know, it just executed and then removed. This makes for great if statements and iterators, I think it's really clean. So I'm kind of surprised that it never caught on. And for some reason, everybody always worries, but what if you have a real line that starts with a percent sign? I don't think that happens very often in HTML, but uh, if you do, you can just double it, and it'll put a real percent sign in there, so you can escape it, basically. Uh, this is a technique I use all the time, but I didn't really realize why I did it until uh, it came up in the Rails view. Uh, Say so you're going to show like a subtotal, a tax, and a total. So you got to calculate the tax, right? And then the total is the subtotal t plus the tax, right? But this code sucks, right? Because we have this variable assignment on that line. If you end up changing the middle line, then you break the end line, uh, stuff like that. There's another way to write code like this, and that's to use a block, right? And then have the uh, tax value passed into the block. You kind of avoid the assignment that way. Ruby does the assignment, but what I really love about it is the block delimits where that value is active, right? So say starting here and ending here, we have this new concept in our views, right? This tax. And if you look at the code in the middle, it's clean, right? It's, it's nice and easy. So that's kind of a neat trick to clean them up. It's really easy to support this. Uh, in fact, you can write your method to go both ways, which is what I did. Uh, just return it in the normal case, but if a block was given, yield the value to the block. Yeah, you had a question? Yeah, why not just use tap? Why not just use tap in that case? Because uh, I had to calculate the tax, but yeah, you could if you had, if you had, if you already had the value in a variable, you could use tap, right? Yeah. Another thing I see people do is like assigning it at the top of the template. Uh, but I don't really like that either, right? And uh, assignments and templates just look bad kind of all together, I think. Best avoided. Uh, this is a, uh, if you use the content tag for helper in Rails at all, um, you, you know, it'll create a div in this case and it'll give it some, an ID of like article one and a class of article. Makes it pretty easy to hit it with like CSS styling and stuff. If you used to use it in a loop like this, you can drop the loop. Just pass the array directly in. It understands that now. And it'll loop over them and generate all the same tags, uh, which is pretty consistent with how Rails renders now, right? Now we can just pass an array of objects to uh, Rails for rendering. Uh, also, you can do um, individual pads for objects. It used to be when you rendered an object as a partial, uh, Rails asked the class what to do with it. So comments, you know, always got rendered as comments. Now it actually asks the object what to do with it, not the class. So you can make that decision like based on some fields, right? What kind of object it is or something. Uh, and so then you see how this renders partial events and it'll go through and they may get rendered with different partials depending on the kind they are. And so if you don't want the variables in the views changing because, you know, if you had an edit view and a view view, uh, then inside those views, it would be called edit and view the object. If you want it to be the same thing, use this as flag, right? So you can say as event, and then that way it's always an event inside the partial. Um, this is one just, I think, good HTML that we sometimes forget about. We give people those, you know, horrible selection menus where they have to select a whole bunch of items. It's kind of nice if we break them down into these nice menus uh, and, uh, Rails has a helper for that. And I bet you guys know about options for select, but there's also a grouped options for select, which will let you pass in a hash, and then you can put the categories and the items in those categories. It's kind of a cleaning up user interface kind of thing. Oh, man, I love this feature. In uh, 
Rails, you can now override the form builders, right? You can build your own form builders. And it's not very hard. All you have to do is inherit from this class, action view, helpers, form builder. And that's the, so when you do form four, right, and we always pass that F object into the block, everybody always calls it F for some reason, that's the form builder, the thing that you call all the methods on, and it builds your form, and you can do whatever you want with it. So in this case, uh, I basically just upgraded Rails' default form builder. I added a, a method that will give you the errors for that particular uh, form field. Then using method missing here, I wrapped the existing methods to understand prefixes like labeled and suffixes with errors. So you don't really need to know how this code works. It just delegates to the underlying methods for uh, generating labels and stuff. But let me show you what it can do. Uh, first, you need to decide how you want to use your form builder. If you want to have a whole bunch of them, you can actually pick which form builder is used when you call the form for. In this case, mine's just the Rails with some new features, so I just want to replace it globally. To do that, you can just require it and set, the, set it as the default form builder. The other thing you probably want to do, Rails automatically at, wraps error fields in divs so, you, so it can hit them with styling, like in its scaffold CSS and stuff. You might want to shut that off, and that's what this code does. And then here's the variations, right? Now you can ask for a text field, a labeled text field, text field with errors, labeled text field with errors. And then like in the resulting HTML, you can get you know, just the normal input. When you ask for a label, it'll put that in there in front of it. Uh, if you ask for errors, when there are any, they'll be added as a span after the field. You can do some pretty neat stuff with this, right? If you have a certain way you always write your forms, like say you love to do them as definition lists, you know, with the field label and the uh, term and the field and the definition. So you can just build a form builder that whenever you ask for a field, it builds both parts for you and you don't have to write the HTML. So it's pretty neat. <laughs> you know, there was a time when you had to like uh, die in battle or be successful in battle to get a theme song. Nowadays you can get one for much less, you know. Working on Rails, you can get your own theme song. Have you guys heard Tender Love's theme song? It's pretty cool. You should go look it up. It's on YouTube. You can listen to that theme song. It's great. Uh, okay, so let's go where the action is. Uh, controllers, routers. Uh, Rails can now route exceptions to any rack application, so anything that supports a call. It turns out the Rails router is a rack application. So if you want, you can just route exceptions to the Rails router. And then you can write routes like this, match 404. And when you get a 404 exception, you can dictate what happens, right? Send it to a controller. Do your normal rail stuff and handle it any way you want to handle it. Uh, rails can also route to Sinatra. I think the most common reason to use this feature is so you can get um, Rescue's web interface inside your application. So that's the example I'll show. If you want to do that, just change your gem require to uh, require the server. That'll give you Rescue's web interface and Rescue itself. And uh, then you'll probably want to restrict access because I assume you don't want everybody on your site to be able to see what your workers are up to. Um, in Rails, you can do that with any object that supports this matches method. And it'll get past the request and it can give a true false answer which turns out to be a thumbs up, thumbs down. The user can see this content, right? So here I just check for the um, user ID, look them up and see if they're an admin, right? Really simple. And then in your routes file, you can require that validator and set the constraint. That'll keep it restricted. And then you can just mount a Sinatra application directly in your routes file. Actually, you can mount any Rack application. So anything that responds to call and takes an environment hash can be used in Rails now. So you can have smaller pieces that you combine into the main app. And then you can just tell, tell Rails where you want to serve it at, right? So, at my application slash admin slash rescue, you'd see the rescue interface. This is another question I get asked pretty often for writing the CSV library. How do I send CSV uh, down to the browser? This is how you do it. Rails understands the CSV MIME type now, so you can just format CSV. Um, for the headers, uh, you want to set this content disposition and set it to attachment. That'll force the browser to download it instead of displaying it inline. And then you can set a file name for your type there, uh, your file. 
can, then Rails can now render any object that responds to each. And Ruby 1.9 has an enumerator which allows you to basically build up an each on the fly. You just append values to it and those end up being what's yielded. So I just set it to an enumerator and the CSV library can write to anything that understands append, which turns out to be the enumerator. So I just wrap that enumerator in a CSV object and then I can write out my headers and uh, fields normally. When you do this kind of trick, be really careful not to do something like article.all because then you loaded it all in memory and defeated the purpose, right? So um, use like uh, find each, which will go over the records in chunks. I think by default it does a thousand of them, but you can configure it to, you know, do it in whatever set you want. So here's another, uh, another great work, book I read recently was uh, Jose Valim's uh, Crafting Rails Applications, and you probably heard us talk about it on Rogues. Uh, but it has this great trick in here uh, that Aaron mostly spoiled in his keynote this morning, <laughs> but still a great trick. Um, if you have some work you want to do in the background, especially if it's I.O. bound, like you want to call out to an API or you want to send an email message, right, which was Aaron's example in his keynote, uh, it's really easy to do that in the background. So here I'm going to add a stats field on, on these uh, articles, and I'm just going to write some code that calculates stats. I'm going to purposefully slow it down, right, so that it kind of simulates something that's slow to do. And I don't want my user to have to wait 10 seconds. So I want to do it in the background uh, after we've finished the request. Ruby has a standard thread library that can do this, so just require a thread, set up your queue. Queue is a thread safe queue, uh, so you can put work in it. And then this is basically the same example Aaron had in his keynote, right? You just have the thread pulling jobs off the queue and doing something. I use call instead of his run so that I can use a normal lambda object. Uh, and then you see there's this one extraneous call to thread. Uh, that's because I want the thread to start up as Rails loads. So I call it right away to make it assign. And then putting jobs in the queue is just as simple as finding the queue, appending a job, which can just be a normal lambda, right? And I put the code in there for what I wanted to do, calculate some stats and save the record. And you can see how I use this. If I create an article and I check it after a couple of seconds, it's still nil because it hasn't shown up yet. It hasn't gone past that 10 second delay. But if I wait long enough, then the stats field just fills in, right? But the user didn't have to wait. We already answered them and we're, we're off doing other things now and you're just processing these in the background. So this is kind of simple background processing without even having to go to, you know, like rescue or Q Classic or something. Okay, have we all learned something yet? <laughs> yeah? It's 41. <laughs> I was really worried there'd be like Rails core team members in here who knew all this crap. So I had to think of something bizarre to use Rails for, you know, to make guarantee that everybody got out of here and learning something new. So it turns out you can actually use Rails to replace Jekyll if you want to. Watch this. <laughs> uh, I reconfigured Rails to um, change its caching settings and asset compiling settings, depending on the special environment variable I could set. And then, after I did that, I also reconfigured the application controller to page cache absolutely everything on the site. You can't really do that through the interface Rails exposes, but I peeked open the source and figured out this will do it. So uh, now it'll page cache absolutely everything. And then I wrote a rig task, which spawns a copy of the server, but it sets that magic variable I used to change all the behaviors. Uh, so this is the special server that has the uh, different behavior. And then I wrote a very quick spider. Uh, it's not important how this works, but it just pokes around the website, touching every single page, right? Loading it uh, using open URI. And if you see, this rig task is dependent on assets precompile. So basically, because I pre-compiled the assets, those end up in the public folder. Then I reconfigured the server to page cache everything and touched every page on the site. Those end up in the public folder. When you're done, you have an entire copy of your site in the public folder. And then you can just rsync it anywhere you want, right? So to a folder, to a server, whatever, and you uh, built a static site. But you can use Rails to, you know, you can use your database, put the content in, use helpers, generate it all, stuff like that. And to use, just, you know, 
right? Static generate anything rsync understands. You can put a user password server there and publish your site directly to your server without needing Rails at all. <laughs> so that's 42. Did you guys memorize all of those? I saw some people yesterday when I was sitting in sessions taking notes. And I was working on this talk at the time. I almost felt sorry for you guys. That's okay. Uh, I promise I will put these slides online. Uh, you can find them on my speaker deck, um, Jeg2 there. I will post to Twitter when I do put them online, probably later today. So I'm Jeg2 on Twitter. You can find me there. If you want to email me about bizarre stuff you saw in this talk, you absolutely can. That's what I got. Thanks very much. <laughs>